Okay, this morning we're going to talk about Satan. Uh, I think uh, this is kind of a subject that most Christians, modern Christians, don't want to hear about. But I think, unfortunately, a lot of people are very ignorant as to who Satan is, uh, what he looks like, what he's doing, uh, and what his future is. So we're going to start out here by looking at Satan's past. Uh, where did he come from? What What's the deal with Satan? We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah 14, verse 12. Now you're going to need a King James Bible for this passage. If you have an NIV, it covers up for Satan here because the NIV is a satanic Bible. So we're going to start out in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Satan has a lot of names in the Bible, and, and this is one of them here. You'll see the word Lucifer. That means it's another name for Satan. He's an angel of light, or appears as an angel of light. But it says here in verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou, thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Uh, Satan's sin was he wanted to be God. And we're going to see another aspect to that as we continue here. But uh, look at verse 15. It says, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Again, if you have an NIV, it says grave there. They take the word hell out. Um, actually, the word hell doesn't appear in the NIV's Old Testament. Um, but anyhow, verse 16, They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? And I don't think that's because Satan is weak and small. I think it's because he appears differently. He appears as an angel of light. And so they look at him and they say, Is that the man? He looks like an angel. He looks like a nice guy. You know? Satan's not this red-horned guy that lives down in hell on a throne. Uh, -uh. he's an angel of light. That's how he appears anyhow. Uh, in reality, he's, he's a, a dragon. But verse 17, That made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof that opened not the house of his prisoners. Okay, but what was Lucifer's original position? You have here described the fall, how he fell. But let's go to the... Uh, chapter here, Ezekiel chapter 28. We're going to see what his original position was. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 1. Okay, it says here, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Now, a lot of people, I actually read some kind of modern commentaries, and they say, well, this is not Satan. This is not describing Satan. It's the prince of Tyrus. Well, if you study your Bible, you know that there are times when Satan can actually enter into people. Okay, the Antichrist is going to be the the greatest manifestation of that. But uh, Mark chapter 8, verse 33 says, But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Luke chapter 4, verse 8 says, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So you see Jesus saying the same thing to Satan physically and to Peter when Satan, you know, I guess entered him or something. I'm not sure there. But then it says, too, about uh, Judas Iscariot, about how that Satan entered him. So Satan, I believe, was probably, you know, in this prince of Tyrus and affecting him. Okay, but... If, if you remember over there in Isaiah chapter 14, it was because Satan wanted to be like the Most High. And here he's saying, verse 2, I am God, I you know, speak as God and everything. It's, and it's a capital G, by the way. And that's important, too. That's an important distinction. And again, i got to hit the NIV here. The NIV takes the capital G out and they put a lowercase g. Okay? That's covering up for the devil. 
because the devil is a lowercase g God, but he's not capital G God. So don't use the NIV. It's a wicked Bible. Uh, perversion, actually. I don't even want to call it a Bible. But look at verse 3. It says, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasuries. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. And you're going to see that thing, we're going to see that as we continue here, that Satan will oftentimes empower world leaders to get great riches. I mean, you have a being there that is at least 6,000 years old. I don't know how, you know, when exactly God created him. He is a created being, and we'll see that as we continue here. But you have a being that's been around for 6,000 years. Do you think he knows how to make money? <laughs> Do you think you could learn how to be in business in 6,000 years? Yeah. yeah. So what happens is you have world leaders, world politicians. They want money. They want riches. So guess who's the best one to get in contact with to get those riches? Mm -hmm. Satan. Satan. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, let's see. Verse 6. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God. Okay, I did read that already, but I wanted to make a point on that. Uh, you actually look at a lot of these big world leaders. I heard a thing about David Rockefeller the one time. He will not allow servants at hotels to look at him in the eyes. They're not allowed to make eye contact with him. Why? He thinks he's a god. He is so rich and he's so powerful and he's above the law. There are a lot of people out there that are above the law. They are that rich and that powerful. Nobody's going to arrest them or put them in prison. Okay, They believe that they are gods. Okay, It's satanic delusion that's in their minds. But let's look at verse 7 here. It says, Behold, thou therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. Okay, brightness, Lucifer, you know, light bearer there. The angel of light. You see that brightness again there. Verse 8. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am, a, I am God? But thou shalt be a man, and no God, in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. That's kind of interesting when you think about it. This powerful being named Satan is going to die the same death as a street prostitute or a druggie or whatever that never repents of their sins. A bunch of bums down there in hell and Satan's with them. Okay? In the end, he's not going to be any better off than any other unrepentant sinner. Pretty interesting. But let's look at verse 11 through 13 now. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. He was created. Satan did not, uh, he was not eternally existing. He, cre he was created by God. Okay, and he was created as, uh, well, we're going to see here in verse 14. Okay, verse 14, it says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. That was his original position. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Um, thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, and that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, 
by the multitude of thy traffic. What did I say? By the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Yeah. Not what I said? No, you said the multitude of thy traffic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Okay, there, of course, I, the final destruction of Satan, which we'll be getting into a little bit later, will be at the end of the Millennial Kingdom. Okay, that's when I believe that that's going to happen there. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you what this iniquity was. Um, turn back to Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to look at one of the greatest sins that can, can be committed. And I'm actually doing a video right now on this subject. Um, I did a, a message, I guess was it, no, it was, I guess it was two weeks ago now, on the unpardonable sin. And... Uh, on the subject of blasphemy as well. And one of the things that you can do uh, that you have to be careful about is that you, we need to have reverence for this book, the Bible. It is a holy book. okay. And when you cause it to be doubted in all these new versions and everything, you cause the unsaved world to mock this book and blaspheme this book. okay. And you will see all throughout the pages of Scripture one of the greatest sins that, that is there is perverting the scripture okay and that's we're going to see when this actually started this this movement genesis chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the lord god had made and he said unto the woman yea hath god said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden he questions what god said and the woman said unto the serpent we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, God did not say, Neither shall ye touch it. She added that. Okay? And then uh, it says here, And then and the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. So he told her, No, God, you know, God's word is not true. It's the opposite of what God said. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So Satan, sin and death was brought into the world because Satan tricked her into changing the word of God, into perverting the word of God. And I, you know, I don't believe that there is a greater sin than perverting Scripture, written Scripture. I mean, if you if you misquote Scripture or something like that, like I did earlier when I was reading, well, you know, it wasn't intentional. But if you actually make a book of written scriptures that are perverted and twisted and change the truth of God into a lie, that's very serious, extremely serious. And it is, a, if you want to see a true manifestation of Satanism, that's it. This stuff that they do out in California, Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan, they're just a bunch of fornicating drug addicts is all they are. It's fleshly. It's mostly fleshly. Okay, True Satanism is scripture perversion. But look at uh, chapter, or chapter 3 here, verse 13 through 15. We'll look at that next. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy he head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So there you have Satan being cursed. Okay? And I believe that Satan did try to be God and things, and then there was some pride issues there. His, his you know, pride was lifted up because of his beauty, but I think that his real serious sin was perverting the scriptures and causing uh, man to sin. But now, that's his past, okay? He started out as the anointed cherub that covereth. He started out as a beautiful um, cherub. I can't really call him an angel because it's they're similar to angels, but a cherub is not the same as an angel. 
but he started out that God created him and he fell, okay, because of pride. So that's his past. But what's his present? What does Satan do right now? And as I stated earlier at the beginning of this message, a lot of people think that Satan is down in hell, ruling and reigning down there. No, he isn't. I'm going to show you what he's doing right now. Turn to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, verse 6. Now, we've been over this before. If you've heard the Halloween message that you, you know, this, I talked a little bit about this, but we'll hit it again because it's important. Job chapter 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. The sons of God there, if you want to look it up, we aren't going to cover it this morning, but chapter 38, Job chapter 38, verses 4 through 7, talks about the sons of God singing for joy before the world was created. So they're not the sons of Seth or, you know, pre-crucifixion Christians or something ridiculous. Okay, they are angels. That's what they are. Verse 7, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Let me just make a point real quick before I continue. Did God not know where he was? The Lord's omnipresent. Why did he ask him where he was? Because Satan has to answer for all of his actions to the Lord. Satan is not allowed to do things without getting God's permission first. You know, which if people are Satanists, they, oh, oh, Satan's a rebel. Actually, no, <laughs> not really. He is, somewhat, but he still has to get God's permission. Okay, he still has to come before God and say, can I do this or can I do that? He's not allowed free reign down here. Satan cannot touch you unless God gives him permission. Verse 8, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. He got permission to attack a godly man. Hmm. You know, it's interesting, the, one, the church we used to go to, there was a guy I talked to the one time, and he was at a Methodist church, modern Methodist, you know. And he said that the pastor actually told the people from the pulpit the, the day that he was visiting, he said the book of Job is actually not Scripture. He said because the God of the Bible would never allow this type of a thing to happen to a godly man. That's what the guy actually said. And according to modern Christianity, the prosperity gospel... This is contrary to the prosperity gospel. The idea of, of God turning Satan over and letting him have his way with a godly man. That's so contrary to modern Christianity. But it happened. Okay? Uh, which, that's another study, but let's go on here. Job chapter 2, verse 1. And basically you have there the rest of chapter 1. Uh, Satan takes away everything, all of his physical possessions. Basically destroys his wealth and his family and everything else. Chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. So Satan is the one that attacked Job, but it was because he got God's permission. So Satan's basically turning, you know, God against Job. Okay? Uh, verse 4, And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath, 
will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. Okay? And, of course, you can read the rest of the story. We aren't going to read it today. But you go into it, and, you know, Job comes out at the end, you know, okay. But the whole point is, Satan, what I want what I want you to get from this passage here, these two chapters, is that Satan has to go before God, okay? He's not down in hell doing things, and God's up there going, oh, no, I can't believe he did that. He has to present himself before the Lord. But now we're going to turn to the New Testament. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. You know, there's a lot of books that have been written on the secret of success. Financial success. Well, I can tell you that the real secret to financial success is right here in Luke chapter 4. And we're going to see it. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it may be, that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into an high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Now look at what the devil says. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine." Hmm, interesting. Verse 8, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Why didn't Jesus correct him? Why didn't Jesus say, Those kingdoms aren't yours, you can't give them to people? Because he could, and he can. Those kingdoms, the kingdoms of this world, are Satan's right now. He is the God of this world, and he can give them to whom he will. But what's the condition? Fall down and worship him. And you can call it conspiracy theory, you can call it whatever you want, but you look into the world leaders, they're all involved in the occult. The real powerful ones. Adolf Hitler, study the Nazi movement sometime. Those guys were heavily into the occult. Very heavily into it. Theosophy and a lot of other things, very much into the occult. Our leaders here in America, you study these guys. Illuminati, Skull and Bones. I mean, you go down through the, the list. They're all involved in these weird secret societies. And, and you know, there's a video out there. Out in California, Northern California, there's a grove out there. Which you can study that. Groves in the Bible. The Bohemian Grove. And all these rich, powerful, influential men go out there and they conduct occult ceremonies. And it's weird because part of the ceremony, they say, they talk about goodly tire. Now, if you remember Ezekiel chapter 28, which we read earlier, Tyre, the king of Tyre. So why are these people in the 21st century, these pagans out, you know, rich pagans out there, why are they talking about Tyre? Hmm. And Babylon, they talk about that too. Very interesting. Uh, but let's continue on here. Um, let's see, where do we stop here? Verse 9. Okay, we'll look at verse... Oh no, okay, I guess... Oh, let me read this real quick here. Second Corinthians 4, 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. I've been talking about that thing of Satan being the God of this world, but that is the actual scripture. Second Corinthians 4, 4. Okay. Uh, Luke chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. Now look at what he says. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, 
lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Satan quoted scripture. Sure. Absolutely. And the scripture that he tried to quote there uh, was Psalm, well, actually Psalm 91 verses 11 through 12, but verse 11 is what he messed up. The actual verse 11 there, Psalm 91, 11 says, For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. So Satan omitted in all thy ways. Kind of interesting scripture there too. 9, 1, 1, 1. <laughs> 9, 11, 1. But probably nothing to that. Okay, look at verse 12. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Not permanently, but just for a season. But now, what does Satan look like today? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15. Of course, we've been over this many times in, in the different messages. But it's so important to get. A lot of people don't understand this today. But it says here, verse 13, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Like we've been saying. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Uh, there's a researcher, he's in prison right now, uh, his name's Fritz Springmeier, and he studied the subject of high-level Satanism and everything, and he said the number one occupation of high-level Satanists is ministers in quote-unquote Christian churches. That's where the majority of them work. And you start to look at some of these big guys in ministry, quote-unquote ministry, and you can see it. You can see that they're working to accomplish Satan's goals. All right? It's just the way it is. But you say, what about this angel of light thing? Well, think about some of the things that are, that are out there. Think about uh, Joseph Smith of the Mormons. Oh, I saw this, this light being. It was God. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> the God of this world, perhaps, but not the God of the Bible. And you'll hear that a lot. You know, these people, oh, I saw this beautiful angel and it was it was light i could barely even look on it it was so bright you know and watch out for that stuff don't fall for that okay now what is satan up to okay we've seen what he looks like how he has to deal with things what he offers to people but what's he up to what's his plan right now turn back to isaiah isaiah chapter 1 You see, the Bible is a great book. It is the greatest book in the universe because it is actually God's written word put down on paper. Now, that's good for two reasons. Well, it's good, it's good for us, for salvation, for doctrine. We can know what the Lord wants for us. But there's also another way that this scripture can be used, and that's how the devil uses it. The devil knows what God says about sin, so the devil, if he wants to destroy people, how can he do it? We've seen already from the book of Job, the devil can't just go out and attack somebody. He has to have God's permission. So how could the devil destroy a nation? By getting that nation to turn on God, and then going to God and saying, it's right here. Your word says you're going to have wrath on these people, and this, is, this has to be punished. See? The devil knows he can't attack them physically, so get them to turn on God, and then God has to deal with them. And you aren't going to stop God. You know, there's just no way. But let's let's see some of the stuff that, uh, what the Bible, what God has to say about judgment, judging sin. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 4. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger, they are gone away backward. Is that true of America today? Yeah. 
I mean, I you know, I'm not anti-American. I'm not anti-Constitution or whatever. I love America. I you know, it's a great country. But Satan turned this country against God. We're going to see that as we continue. Well, why haven't we been destroyed yet? Verse nine. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. There's still a remnant, a very strong remnant, of King James Bible-believing Christians in America, and that's why we still have clothes on our back and food in our stomachs and houses to live in. But the less of us there are, the more of God's judgment is going to come down on this nation. Okay? Isaiah chapter 10. Go over there next. Isaiah chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. We're going to show you another way that God will judge a nation that turns against him. Okay, verse 5. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send him against an hypocritical nation, and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. God will raise up heathen nations to attack a formerly godly nation. Okay? And what it, what more of a hypocritical nation is there than America right now? I mean, most of the preachers in America are standing up preaching out of Bibles that they don't even believe in. You talk about hypocrisy. Okay, turn over to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 12. Okay, for the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. Hmm. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 5. Go there next. Jeremiah chapter 5. You read the book of Jeremiah sometime and look at all the applications. God is speaking to Israel, okay? But there's a lot of application to America as well. You see the same things happening, okay? Uh, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 25. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things from you. For among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait... As he that setteth snares, they set a trap, they catch men. As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore they are become great and waxen rich. They are waxen fat. They shine. Yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. Isn't that interesting? My people overpass the deeds of the wicked. Hmm. That's pretty wild. There are lost people that live cleaner today than professing Christians. And that's something. Uh, they judge not the cause, they, the cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper, and the right of the needy do they not judge. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. And what will ye do in the end thereof? Hmm. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers, having itching ears. Hmm. You say, well, this this stuff is all in the Old Testament, you know. We don't serve the God of the Old Testament. We serve the God of the New Testament, blah, blah, blah. A lot of Christians say that. Well, Romans chapter 15, verse 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. This is written for your learning. And you ought to go back to the Old Testament occasionally and you ought to see the way Israel would turn against God and then how God would punish them. And he would he tells them what to do, how to come back and get his blessing. And they don't do it. You know, their hearts become hardened. So, just to kind of recap here, in Job, we learned that Satan cannot attack somebody without God's permission. So, how does Satan destroy a nation? Turn them against God. Okay? And you want proof of this. You want proof that there is some satanic stuff going on. Get a dollar bill. 
And look at the back, the Great Seal. Annuit Shaptus Novus Ordo Seclorum, announcing the birth of a new order that's secular, without God. It's right there. And I've had people say, oh, that's conspiracy theory. What does it mean? Look it up in a Latin English dictionary. What do the words mean? It's right there. It's right in front of you. That's the plan of Satan and the people that follow him. Turn the people against God. And, you know, I, I'm involved in the whole patriot movement. I do a lot of study and research in that whole thing. And these people, oh, we want America back. We want to bring America back and everything. But they hate God. They hate his word. They hate King James Bible believers. Well, how are you going to bring America back? Isn't going to happen. It's not going to happen. Okay, but now let's look at Satan's future. We've seen his past. We've seen what he's doing right now. He's bringing all nations against God, turning everybody against God so that God has to pour out his wrath. But let's look at his future. Revelation chapter 12. This will be the final part of the message. Revelation chapter 12. Verse 7. And of course, you can listen to the messages on the pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, we are with the Lord at this point here, Revelation chapter 12. But it says here in verse 7, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. You say, well, who's the dragon? Read verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Okay? Now what's the implication there? Where's Satan going to be when we're raptured? Well, probably up there. You know, going up and down, you know, coming in and out there. But he's cast out essentially halfway through the tribulation time period. Okay, and at that point, it's going to get real bad. Look at verses 10 through 13. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Huh. So there's another thing that Satan's doing right now. Not, as, not only is he trying to turn the lost world against God, but he's also accusing us. When we mess up, Satan's up there, probably has a King James Bible, and he's saying, look, hey, your word says that you're to punish for this. Look, at, They did it. They did it. He's accusing the brethren. Okay? Just another thing that he does. Verse 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Oh, but I'm sure the devil's going to spare those that worship him down here. <laughs> yeah, right. He'll turn on those people and devour them and destroy them. You know? And that's actually something that happens a lot of times to these powerful dictators, tyrannical type of governments. The worst people that work for them, the, the ones that kill and everything, the guys at the top will oftentimes get rid of them because they say, hey, if they're that anxious to kill, they could turn on me like that. Yeah. And so those people that, that try to be loyal to that dictator, they'll oftentimes the dictator will kill them first. Yeah. And that's the way it's going to be with Satan. These people, oh, well, I'm a member of the Illuminati and I'm, I'm all this powerful, high-ranking Satanist. They're probably the ones the devil's going to get rid of first. You know, and you say, well, that's that's not going to happen for a long time. This could happen soon, very soon. The next major event is going to be the rapture, the catching up of the body of Christ. After that, this event's only three and a half years away. Wow. <laughs> I mean, if the rapture happens here in the next year or two, you're looking at less than five years. This is being fulfilled. That's incredible. These big powerful men living in their mansions and everything, nobody can touch me. Don't look at me in the eyes. Five years away from being destroyed. Incredible. Okay, let's continue on here. Uh, turn to Revelation chapter 20. 
I think Revelation chapter 20 is probably the devil's most hated chapter in the entire Bible because this is his future. First, he gets kicked out of heaven. That's bad enough. But then this is where it really gets bad. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, no confusion as to who he is, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Okay. Read Revelation 19 sometime. Jesus Christ comes down. We come down with him. Satan at that point is taken, thrown into the bottomless pit. Remember, he got kicked out of heaven. So where's he at? He's here on the earth. You grab him, stick him down in the bottomless pit. It's interesting. Romans chapter 16, verses 19 through 20 says, For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. In the millennial kingdom, Satan is going to be bruised under our feet as Christians. He's going to be down there in the earth knowing he can't do a thing about it until a thousand years is, is you know, fulfilled, basically. Then he gets loosed a little season. Okay, but then what happens when he gets loosed? Look at verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them to ba together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The beloved city there. Study your Bible. It's Jerusalem. Okay? And these, and I'm sorry, but these crazy nuts out there that are trying to make the Jews uh, white Americans or Europeans or something, they don't know what they're talking about. I get very sick and tired of that. I get a lot of that online. These people coming and, oh, the Jews are wicked. They're evil. They're not God's people. Then why are you calling them the Jews? I mean, if we are the replacement Jews, then why do you call the people in Israel Jews? It's kind of, you know, stupid. But, you know, the whole world is going to turn against the Jewish people, and, and so you have it already happening right now. And a lot of professing, quote-unquote, Christians are very guilty of that. But look at verse 10, Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Satan's, you know, most feared verse. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Amen. That's his future. That's where he's going. Okay? We're not there yet. Satan's not in hell right now. Okay? He's, right now he's very busy setting up this kingdom, this world government. And he's very busy turning America against God. And what is our job? To bring revival. No, it's not to bring revival. We can't bring revival. We're not going to bring America back to the glory days that it once was. Don't be deceived in that. And there's a lot of Christians that, that love life down here. And, you know, I understand that. I understand we can have a good life down here and everything. You know, you shouldn't, this Catholic thing of, of self-flagellation and beating yourself and forcing yourself to live in poverty. No, you don't have to do that. You can enjoy life down here. But don't get so caught up in this life that you aren't willing to see things go downhill. Okay? Don't fall for that either. What's our job? Well, rear guard action. Hold the fort, for I am coming. That's it. Do what you can. Put some tracks out. Tell people about the Bible version issue. Witness to people. But don't expect to have this massive revival. It's not going to happen. You know, Satan has taken over. And God is going to pour out His wrath very soon. So, that's it for this morning. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. 
If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.